I'm Mark. And I'm Josh. And this is Alter Ego Comics TV, episode number 110. We are from the comic book store Alter Ego Comics, located in Lima, Ohio. Every week we read a big stack of new releases and come back and let you know what we recommend, uh, because there's just so much to choose from. So, before we get to that, though, we are in our third week of March Madness. We were ahead of the actual March Madness tournament. We wanted to do it first. Uh, so we're in our third week, and Josh has an update on how that's going. All right. Uh, in the Northwest bracket, we've got Batman decimating Adventure Time almost to a man. Uh, in the Southwest, we've got Super... I'm sorry. Amazing Spider-Man Spider Island fought valiantly but could not stand against the combined might of the Justice League. We've got in the Northeast, Daredevil versus Saga. Saga triumphing pretty handily, almost doubling Daredevil's numbers. And uh, in the Southeast, did I say Southeast? And in the Southeast, we've got Wonder Woman versus Manhattan Projects, with Manhattan Projects just squeaking out by the barest of margins. So uh, we're seeing some heavy hitters and heavy favorites coming up against each other in the next round. It's going to be great, so check, make sure you vote this week. So the four books that we're down to this week are 20% off here at Alter Ego, and we'll see who the, the final two are going to be next week. Look forward to that. <laughs> and speaking of things that we look forward to, uh, the first book that I want to talk about this week is Saga, issue number 11. This is by Brian K. Vaughan and Fiona Staples, and this should come as no surprise that we're talking about it. And even on, on months or weeks when we don't talk about Saga, we're talking about it in our heads. So we, we talk about it off camera uh, because there is not a month that goes by where this is not an awesome book. And this week, though, just really uh, it compelled me to speak about it this week because some, some stuff happens. Uh, and the nice thing about this series, again, we're 11 issues in, but there's really a nice forward momentum going with this book. We've had, we've had a, a lot of opportunities to get to know these characters, and that's, that's part of the beauty of the book and part of, of Vaughn's writing, <laughs> great writing ability, is he gets you to care about characters very quickly. So we've seen the relationship between Alana and Marco. We see a little flashback to, uh, <laughs> actually the opening scene in here is priceless. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's awesome, it's, it's kind of similar to the opening scene in the first issue, uh, in that there are boobies. And <laughs> but it's just great to see how, they're, how where their relationship started, how it has evolved, uh, the introduction of, of their daughter, the ghost babysitter, and now we've got uh, Marco's parents there, and they they add something new to the mix. They remind me a little bit of uh, George Costanza's parents, <laughs> but not so much. I, I really don't know what to say. I can't tell you a whole lot about this book without spoiling some things, uh, this particular issue, but bottom line is you should be reading Saga. If you've tried it and you didn't like it, I know some of you have posted in the comments that you did try the first couple issues and didn't like it, that's fine. It's not. It may not be for everybody, but I disagree. It is for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so this is one of those books. When you, and if you read the letters pages in this issue, you'll see that uh, many people have mentioned that they gave the first uh, first trade paperback to family and friends and anybody they can think of for Christmas. And it's kind of their go-to gift to to give to somebody who's just getting into comics. And I would definitely uh, agree with that. That if you have a family member or a friend that you're trying to get into comics and they may not like capes and tights, they may not like superhero books, give them a copy of Saga or let them read your copy, let them read your single issues. And I, I would say nine times out of ten they're going to be hooked. So it's really just you know the 10% of you that don't like it. Find something else. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. Uh, but Saga, 11, awesome. Do you have anything to add? Uh, I no, uh, I would echo what you said about momentum. I think it's really amazing. If I think about um, the first two arcs on Jeff Johns' Justice League, you know, they spent the entire first arc putting together a team, which, remind you, remember, is made up entirely of characters that have been around for 50 years at least. Uh, and then the second arc was kind of a cool story arc, but they really didn't cover a lot of ground in 12 issues. We're uh, not even through the 12th issue of Saga, and I feel like they've done so much more. They've introduced this entire universe. I mean, in this issue alone, we've got resolutions of character cliffhangers from the previous issue, plot cliffhangers from the previous issue, uh, long-running gags. I, I feel like they're just cramming so much into each issue, uh, and it's almost, uh, it's almost like poetic, the way he gets so much into so little. It's like every line is perfectly crafted to give you exactly the meaning you need and not waste any space, and it's just... It's a joy to read. And I, I haven't mentioned it, but I do want to give a shout out to Fiona Staples' artwork on this because it is absolutely a 50 50 uh, <laughs> collaboration. collaboration on this. You know, Brian K. Vaughn is one of the best writers in comics. I don't know if this story would work as well as it does without Fiona Staples providing the artwork. If it was just kind of standard 
comic book, traditional comic book style artwork, it might not be as good. It probably wouldn't be as good. Fiona Staples brings a new level of, of I'm going to say it again, awesomeness. Someone asked the counter, asked for the counter to come back after uh, last week's episode. So maybe we'll bring the awesome counter back. Who knows? So that's Saga. Uh, new number one this week from DC is Constantine. Uh, this features John Constantine, who's had a long, long run in the Vertigo title Hellblazer and has recently been burning up in D Justice League Dark, as well as cameos in Amethyst and a few other DC books. Uh, this is written by Jeff Lemire, with co-writing by Ray Fox and art by Renato Guedes. Guedes, yeah. Uh, I actually really like this book. I was never a hardcore Hellblazer fan, but uh, there are definitely arcs I loved. I mean, the Gar Garth Ennis stuff with the cancer arc, the Mike Carey books, I was a huge fan. I followed his run pretty closely. And like a lot of people, I was... Uh, I had some trepidations about taking John, who's a very hard R character, and squeezing him into the DC Universe, which is much more PG-13. And I think they did actually a really good job with this first issue. They uh, kept, I mean, obviously there's not nudity, sex, drugs, and foul language in this, but they kept the edge of the character. They put everything, they took everything that was core to what Constantine is and made him carry through. He's still a bastard. And that's, that's the primary character description of John Constantine. That's who he is. They managed to make it play in the universe, and they're also tying it in with the magic stuff and the other new 52 characters in a way that's interesting and actually makes me care. So I I'm, was trepidatious, but I really enjoyed Constantine, and I think if you're a Hellblazer fan, you will too. Next up for me is uh, Vibe. Sorry, Justice League of America's Vibe number two. Uh, as you may recall, I spoke about issue number one and was very pleased with that issue, pleasantly surprised, similar to what Josh just said about Constantine. There were certain expectations about the character of Vibe, who was a D-list Justice Leaguer at best in the 1980s, uh, and bringing him into the New 52. But the first issue was very, very good, uh, co-written by Jeff Johns and Andrew Kreisberg, with art by Pete Woods, and we get that team back again for issue number two. Uh, I think part of my, my affinity, is that a word? Yes, for this book. <laughs> in my, for my infinity. Part of my affinity for this book is uh, that it does take place in Detroit, that, uh, which is where I'm from. And uh, I, I have a soft spot in my heart for the Detroit Justice League, which Vibe was a part of. And we actually get to see uh, another member of that team, Gypsy. We see a little bit of her, a little bit more of her in this story. She's basically being held for her own good in the Argus labs and, and the Argus installation. Uh, which has put together this, this B team of Justice Leaguers to eventually take on the regular Justice League if and when they, they go rogue. Uh, but Vibe is turning out to be a very interesting character. DC has struggled with their teenage heroes. Uh, it seems like every time they, they hit their stride with one, they bring in a new creative team and then they destroy it. I'm looking at you, Blue Beetle. <laughs> uh, but so far, he's a very relatable and likable character. His powers, we don't really know a lot about at this point, but He's very powerful. Uh, Jeff Johns has mentioned uh, many times that Vibe is going to be a major power player in the DC Universe, and you should get on board early <laughs> so that you stay up to date on what's going on. So we see uh, Vibe, Vibe's introduction to the new members of the Justice League, Justice League of America. This is going to get confusing. Justice League, Justice League of America. And he's, he's a fan. He's kind of awestruck and starstruck when he meets Stargirl. Um, He's <laughs> afraid of Hawkman. I mean, there's, there's fun stuff going on in here. There's good action. Uh, there's, as I said, fun. And I, I hope that the public catches on. Uh, initial sales of Vibe nationally are abysmally low. <laughs> so I honestly don't know how long the, the series is going to end up sticking around for. So if you want to read another good series by Jeff Johns, pick it up while you can and show DC that you're supporting this character. Um, who, who meets a couple of the demands that the comics community has asked for. You've got a teenage hero and you've got a uh, Latin American hero. So if you're not buying it, it's good. It really is. Uh, if you don't support it and it goes away, then don't slam DC for trying to introduce new characters of, of different ethnic origins and age groups. So there. <laughs> Justice League Vibe, actually what I, I really like about uh, Justice League Vibe, you're right, it is weird to say out loud. Uh, what I like it as a companion book to the regular JLA, both the first issue and the second issue have had scenes that are in both books and kind of seeing this character's life and how it wraps around the Justice League. It's interesting because we see Superman in the Justice League all the time, but he's in so many books that he's, his life's not really structured in any meaningful way. But we see the way these great, powerful interactions affect a minor character, both, well, yeah. And uh, it's really cool. I just like reading things that connect. It's, it feels like the old Stan Lee Marvel stuff where everything kind of made sense. 
Not like now where everybody's everywhere. Uh, next up, speaking of old Stan Lee stuff, we've got Spider-Man, except it's Ultimate Comics Spider-Man. Still written by Mike, Brian Michael Bendis with art by Sarah Pacelli. And uh, this continues the Venom War storyline that's been going on for a couple issues. And it's really good. Uh, I don't know what it is, but Bendis seems to continue to, uh, to pay dividends to people who were fan of the original Peter Parker with the new Miles Morales character. Uh, the strong players in this issue are Mary Jane Watson and... Gwen Stacy, and it's so cool to see, you know, these characters that, uh, people who were a fly on the wall who were minor characters in Peter's life, now kind of trying to guide this new Spider-Man as he deals with things they're aware of, and just seeing this kid kind of come at it from a different angle than Peter does, to think about things differently, and it's, it's the great strength of the book, too, that they can take the icon of Spider-Man and completely change the character and still make them kind of feel the same and still be really new and surprising. So, Ultimate Comic Spider-Man is still awesome. As it is every month. <laughs> yeah, I, I've said it before, many many episodes episodes ago. I think somebody asked what uh, what three comics would we take with us on a desert island, or or what would you keep reading, or something like that. Uh, Ultimate Comic Spider Man for me is is a must read. <laughs> it's always at the top of my stack when it comes out, and I I could even go back and read it. the many volumes of collected editions that are out, starting with the first volume of Ultimate Spider Man, which came out in two thousand all the way through to the Miles Morales stuff. Uh, Bendis is just you know, hitting it out of the park, as Josh said. And another great thing about that book and the book I'm about to talk about is that it's perfect for younger readers. And by younger, I mean probably you know, 11 and up for Ultimate Comic Spider-Man and also for Nova, issue number two. This is by uh, Jeff Loeb and Ed McGinnis. And this is the best stuff that Loeb and McGinnis have done in years, uh, Loeb especially. <laughs> it's, it's the best written Jeff Loeb book in a very long time, and I, I don't mean to be cruel to Mr. Loeb, but uh, he was kind of at the top of his game when he was doing his collaborations with Tim Sale over at DC, and then his Marvel stuff yeah, didn't really work for everybody, but Nova is just excellent. It is, again, the introduction of a new character to the Marvel Universe, you know, a new-ish character. You know, the, the character of Nova's been around since 1976, but this is a new person as Nova. Uh, which is also the uh, the character that's on the Ultimate Comics or the Ultimate Spider-Man uh, TV series cartoon show on uh, Disney XD. Sam Alexander. So, long story short, or maybe long story long, uh, this kid's dad was a member of the Nova Corps, and he thought he was just a drunk and making up stories about his glory days, fighting aliens in space and things like that. Turns out he's telling the truth, and uh, his son, who is a teen, young teenager. Uh, inherits his his helmet, his Nova helmet, Nova Corps helmet. He puts it on, and he gets a recorded holographic message explaining a little bit of what's going on. Uh, but, and then he, you get the the same thing we got with Miles Morales when he first became Spider-Man. The the trial and error process with the powers. You know, how does the suit work? How do I slow down? How do I land? You know, what are its capabilities? And you know, disbelief that oh my gosh, this is really happening to me. And there's definitely going to be crossover with Guardians of the Galaxy. Rocket Raccoon and Gamora are in here. And at the end of the book, if you read the letters pages and, and the summary at the back, you'll see that big things are planned for Marvel Space. And that should be the case because we've got a big Guardians of the Galaxy movie coming out in 2014, uh, which is going to be crazy big. So if you want to kind of get in on the ground floor with the, the Marvel Space stuff, Pick up Nova, first two issues are out. Pick up Guardians of the Galaxy point one, and issue number one comes out in the next couple of weeks. They're just fun. They're fun, they're fresh, they're action-packed, exciting. And one of the things that I always keep in mind as, as a parent, you know, I can give this to my 12-year-old and let him read it. I can give it to, or he's 13, sorry. <laughs> I can give it to that kid in my house, the, the oldest one. And uh, my 11-year-old can read it as well. The three-year-old can't read yet, but uh, maybe when he gets older, he'll be able to read this too. I, I really just can't express enough how fun I think this book is. It's same with Ultimate Comics Spider-Man. They're just uh, so good. Way to go, Marvel. Introducing some new characters that hopefully will have legs and stick around for decades. Uh, my last pick this week is Five Ghosts Number 1, subtitled The Haunting of Fabian Gray. Uh, this is a new number one from Image. It is written by Frank Barbieri, Bar Barbieri and uh, art by Chris Mooneyham. Mooneyham, that's a great name. <laughs> it's fun to Isn't say. Isn't that a funny name? It is a funny name. Uh, this is a, a completely new property. Basically, you have a man who is, uh, let's say, cursed, or somehow he has come across this ability where he's sort of possessed by these five ghosts. 
Uh, and each one has a particular skill set. One's like a samurai, one's a master archer, one's a wizard, one's a vampire, possibly Dracula, and the others is like a Sherlock Holmes type investigator. And it's it's interesting. He can they sort of subsume his personality, and for a brief period, he can use their abilities. And he's not totally in control, and that's the hook. That's what it's about. It's this guy that possesses different things. But I think what this book does especially well is that it's more than the hook. Uh, the first issue, usually you see a lot of setup, this is what's going on, and then we move on. Uh, to then the next issue, and you get more character depth as you go. But they've started with a really strong first issue. You've got character motivations. You understand why he does what he does. And at its heart, it's, it's not just a sci-fi adventure story or a sci-fi fantasy story. It's, it's adventure. It's Indiana Jones. It's dark crypts and artifacts and, and swashbuckling. And uh, I think they did a really good job of making you care about this guy in one issue. So I absolutely recommend checking out. It's a part one of five, so it's just a short run if you don't want to get invested in something long term. I'm sure if it's good, we'll see more after that. But uh, Five Ghosts, number one, one of my picks of the week. It, it is also a pick of the week of, of mine, but I, didn't, I knew I was going to talk... <laughs> be long-winded with the three, so I didn't want to add it. But yeah, it's definitely an Indiana Jones supernatural type of thing. Uh, one of the things I really liked about it was the artwork. Uh, I'm, I'm always uh, drawn to good artwork, no pun intended. And this kind of reminded me a little bit of Jim Aparo and a little bit of Klaus Janssen stuff. So if you like either of those two artists, uh, you definitely want to flip through this and check it out. But the story is top-notch as well. So another great week for comics. There were actually tons of books we could have talked about, but we're trying to keep the episodes to about 10 to 15 minutes, so we don't want to go on too long, which is mainly my problem and not Josh's problem. Uh, so if you uh, agree with what we're saying, leave some comments below. If you disagree, let us know. If you're reading something that you really enjoy and you want other people to know, post it in the comments so that people will read it. And please uh, share the video with your friends and, and people that you think might be interested in our comic reviews. Until next time, thank you for watching.